Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this business uh, event with Greg Araki. Um, this is a remarkable filmmaker. He's really been on the forefront of indie filmmaking and queer cinema. He was the first winner of the Queer Palm at the Cannes Film Festival for the movie Kaboom. Um, and he is responsible for such wildly different films as Mysterious Skin and um, probably every actor's favorite, Smiley Face. Uh, he is now the creator, writer, director, and executive producer of Now Apocalypse. Please welcome Greg Araki. Thank well, you so much for being up here. here. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's surprising. Now I know right. how actors feel. It's just like, ah. Yes. Oh. Well, as a director, you probably um, appreciate the I'm lighting. Not there yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you much, so much for being here. Congratulations on such a fun show. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, I wish I actually could have watched it with you guys because watching it with actors, I think, probably mm. takes on a whole nother level. Mm. <laughs> There's a lot of like inside kind of Hollywood oh, yeah. jokes in the show in general. So. Wait until you get to episode three. That's the one with the uh, Mary Lynn Ray Scub plays an acting teacher, and y you'll love it. Yeah, she's from uh, the movie Mr. Skin I did with her, and she's like wonderful. She's in actually two and three. She plays the sort of shady acting teacher that uh, that Carly like uh, meets in her class. We and don't then, know any of those. And then episode four actually has Drew Drogi playing like the meanest casting director in the world. I so love Drew. Drew's, oh my god, he is amazing. He like um, I actually wrote this. I, I worked with him in he on Heather's, and um, he's just such a. I mean, I've known him for years, and he's such a cool guy. And um, we, I kind of wrote the character just for him after working with him, That's and so cool. he came in and like improvised half his lines, and it's like one of my favorite scenes in the whole series. So you're open to that? You don't mind improvisation? Well, <laughs> I mean, usually for Drew, I mean, Drew is such a you know kind of genius. So um, usually on my the rest of the show is pretty much all scripted. There's a li there's a few throwaway things, and the actors would come up with, it with certain moments. But we shot the sh whole show so quickly. We shot the show was made in a very different way from most TV shows in the sense that we wrote all ten episodes before we started production, and the entire show was cross boarded. So wow. we shot the thing like a giant movie, and we only shot for um, two months. So we shot all 10 episodes in two months, which was like four days per episode. It was intense. So we didn't have a lot of time. It wasn't a lot of luxury of like, okay, let's just mess around. It was like banging through like 10, 11 pages a day. So. That is insane. Um, I heard 40 days, basically. Yeah, four wow. days per episode. That's amazing. Um, and this is sort of your first, well, not your first foray into television. You did an MTV series. You did a pilot many years ago. Yeah, I've been wanting to make um, a TV show since um, I did a film called Nowhere back in the 90s, like 97, 96. And I was, you know, very much a child of like the Twin Peaks kind of era. And um, David Lynch has always been a giant, giant influence on me in that show. And I've always wanted to do something like that, like super unusual and groundbreaking and just crazy and just put it on TV and let people <laughs> go, what was that? And so I wanted to do a show for you know at least 20, 25 years. And um, the MTV pilot was sort of um, one of an early attempt at something like that. And uh, But this show was just this weird level of everything kind of coming together at exactly the right time. It's very... Um, I had been directing some um, episodic TV. I started about, I think, three years ago with American Crime, the John Ridley show. Mm -hmm. um, he was sort of looking for the kind of Sundancey directors to direct his show, and um, and I had never done another person's episodic before, and he just called me up by the blue. He's like, oh, I'm a big Mysterious Skin fan. You know, would you consider directing an episode? I'm all, oh, I've never done it before. <laughs> Thank you for asking. And so... Um, so I did that show, and then you know, once I did one, like all the, I got all these other shows like uh, Riverdale and Thirteen Reasons Why and Red Oaks, which is where I met um, Craig Jacobs, the um, one of the main executive producers on on this show. And um, can I ask, what is it like coming into somebody else's existing show? I I actually really a chapter. I actually li really liked it. Um, I remember telling a, f a filmmaker friend of mine, it was really fun doing episodic because. I felt like you got to make a little movie, you know, mm -hmm. and you get to work with these amazing actors and, you know, really sort of make a little mini movie and uh, practice your, like, filmmaking style and uh, try to make the coolest 
most sort of cinematic episode you can, but you have no artistic responsibility. <laughs> it's all on the showrunner. Like, it's the showrunner's vision. It's their show. It's like they take all the credit and all the blame. <laughs> so you really can just sort of have fun with it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, to, you know, this like usually they take about two weeks, three weeks. And it's, it's kind of not the commitment of making a movie which is like years out of your life and it's like you're so invested in it and it becomes such a thing for you so for me doing tv um for a couple of years it was really great it was a great i call it like going to tv school because i went to film school at usc back in the 80s and for me doing other people's episodic was really learning so much about tv and how tv shot and how how it's done and how what a showrunner does and and all and all the work that's involved and i remember thinking um after working on certain shows Actually, every show I worked on, the show with John Ridley and 13 Reasons Why with Brian Yorkie and Riverdale with Roberto, it's like these guys work so hard. Like mm -hmm. anybody out there who's ever thought about running a show, it is the like most insane. None of these people ever sleep. It's like a 24-hour day. You're like writing one episode like on, on set while they're shooting, and then you're also looking at the cut of the next. You know, it's like you're doing so many things at once, and it's so stressful. And I was thinking like, I remember thinking like if I ever like I could never do that unless it was literally my all-time ultimate dream show like something that is something I've always wanted to do and it's just exactly my perfect show <laughs> like something I'm 110% into and so I li literally one day just started thinking about like okay, well if I did this dream show like what would it be and um I had actually met um Avenjogia um, he we were in a, he did a short film together around this time, and I also met Carly Shortino, who is my co-writer. Um, I got involved in a small um, her the first feature, feature script she wrote. I got attached to um, direct and produce it. So I met Carly, and um, they're Avin and Carly are both just super cool. Like they're mm -hmm. just really cool millennial people, and. Um, Avin's younger than Carl. Avin's like 20, it was like 25, 26 when I met him. And he plays Ulysses. He plays Ulysses. Yes. yes. And, um, and, and Carly, uh, is just such a character. She's so funny and she writes the sex column for Vogue and she's very just outspoken and just a real like character and super cool. And so I started thinking about what if the show was like a queer version of Avin and this sort of character loosely fictionalized version of Carly and they hang out together in LA and they're you know they want to be actors or they want to be in in the business in some way and then from there I came up with the the roommate and um Roxanne Roxanne Mosquito who plays Severine I wrote that part just for her we she was in my film Kaboom and I just love Roxanne yeah, she's fantastic I just love her yeah. so much I mean I think she's just like one of a kind of first actor. And so I wrote the part of the submarine for her. And so I started thinking of these four characters. And that's like, then from there, the sort of universe of the world kind of, um, the universe of the show kind of grew out of that. But I literally just called Carly up and I said, I'm working on this crazy spec script, you know, um, you know, do you want to write it with me? And she's like, oh my God, yes, yes. So we just wrote this script on spec and it was really just one of those projects of mine. I thought that this is my dream project. Mm -hmm. Maybe one day it'll get made. Maybe it'll just sit on a shelf like like some of the other things I've been working on for years and years. And it was really all Greg Jacobs who I'd met on Red Oaks. Um, he, I, we had lunch one day and um, he just out was like, oh, what are you working on? I'm like, oh, I have this script I'm working on. He said, oh, can I read it? And it wasn't even like, will you produce this or anything. He just, he's all, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm doing this thing. And he read it and he's like, oh my God, I love this. Like, he called me the next morning. I love this. What can I, what can I do? How can I help? And um, he gave to Soderberg and Soderberg has this special deal at Stars where um, he makes the girl, or made the girlfriend experience. And they, he has this, you know, special Steve Soderbergh deal, which is, you know, when you win a couple Oscars, I guess you yeah. get that, um, where they, he makes these sort of indie TV shows mm -hmm. for, a, like, that's why our budget was so tight, and that's why our shooting schedule was so tight, but he gets creative freedom, final cut, the whole ten, the whole nine yards, and, and so for me, having made indie films for 30-some years, I'm so used to that schedule, and I'm, and I'm so, I actually enjoy working like that. 
So um, we made this show as this kind of indie TV show, but we had literally could do whatever we wanted, and it happened so quickly. It was it it was one of those stories that like n- never happens in Hollywood, and it just happened. Everything like all the stars kind of lined up for this show, and um, we walked in, and they they were, this is exactly the show we want right now, and you know we're, we're launching this app, and we're trying to get this younger demographic, and. And so, um, did they read the scripts? Because I'm trying to imagine the pitch to this. No, literally, we wrote this. (laughs) We wrote the pilot script on spec, right? And we we submitted that to them. And then we, Carly and I, went in and pitched, and we just said, "We're gonna make. We want to make the craziest, sexiest show that's like nothing else on television. Like it's it's so outside of the box." And they were like, "Bring it on," you know. And and literally. Um, they never said no to us, so it was. It was. I've never had an. Exp- I mean, I've had various TV development deals and you know written scripts and I did that MTV pilot and you know just in general TV especially, um, and spe- you know the TV shows, the episodic shows I worked on. The network usually gives you tons uh-huh. of notes, so much interference, so much every decision every creative thing is like do you can you do this instead of this and this instead of and it's just like constant just like barrage of stuff but this show it was like carly and i were just laughing about it because we were just like turn these scripts in that were just this i mean you've seen episode one now that all there's nine more they're actually yeah. you can actually binge them for free i shouldn't say this to the stars in the audience if you get a seven day trial of stars the app <laughs> you can actually watch them download them and then uh, jump off but <laughs> or stay on <laughs> don't tell them i continue, said that uh, this is actually being, stars entertainment this is actually being recorded probably right yes. Yes. um anyway <laughs> but now the 10 episodes get like this show you know the pilot's pretty crazy but the 10 episodes like get more and more insane mm-hmm. and nine and ten are seriously some the i'm it's like the work i'm most proud of probably of anything i've ever done but um Crazy shit happens in the show, and they never said no to us. It was really kind of mind-boggling. Like we would turn these scripts. In, we wrote all ten scripts before we started, and um, I remember turning them in. And you know, we turn them, we give them to Greg and Soderbergh first, and they go, "Oh, great!" <laughs> <laughs> Literally, those are every note was the, yeah. every script like script one hundred six, great, one hundred seven, great. So we turn these scripts in, and then stars like just said fine and they and so that's what was so exciting and amazing about this experience and i'll probably never have this experience again is it it was just creatively just totally sort of my imagination unleashed with like unbridled with no restrictions and it was so exciting and so fun for me to do i mean i just and i really feel like it sort of shows in the show because there's just this kind of joy of just getting away with shit yeah. <laughs> you can't believe we're getting away with did you um go through any kind of a casting process for any of the other roles because you're really good at discovering yeah talent. casting was very um laborious and difficult um it, it, you know, it's like I, as I said, I wrote the part for Adam, but I had no idea if he could do it or not. Um, oh, really? <laughs> well, it's also because it's like you know, Adam. You know, when I met with Adam and talked to him about the show, he's all, you know, I, he's been on a couple of shows. He's all, I really don't want to do another show. Like young actors, for the most part, hate the idea of doing a series because really? they, they don't want to be on a show for six years because you have to sign this contract like out of the gate, and um, especially you know if you're 25, it's just like. You're on a show for six, seven years, and you're playing a fucking vampire or something, <laughs> like what a wolf or whatever. You know what I mean? And so they get on, stuck on these shows, and they're like, "Get me out of this fucking show." So, and Avin's very—he's like his character. That's kind of why I base the character on. He's just very artistic. He yeah. just wrote a book of poetry about. Oh wow! And yeah, I mean, he's just—he's just cool. He paints, and you know, he's—he's he's just a cool dude, and. And he's like, "I don't want to really be on a show." And the way we had to pitch it to all these actors was. We literally shoot like two months a year. So you can have 10 months a year out of the year to do, you know, whatever whatever you want, you know, a Marvel movie or whatever. Just come back, you know, and do it your little summer camp with us. And so that was how we got, you know, all these. I mean, like Bo has been on a show, Avin, you know, it's like Tyler. Well, Tyler's actually just recurring for us. But, um, but yeah, so was, we got this amazing cast. Um, Jacob Artis from Glee shows up in a very important role in the last four episodes. The, he's sort of, the way I described it is he's sort of, 
um, to use the Sex and the City reference, he's like the Aiden to um, <laughs> to Tyler's Mr. Big. Okay. So he plays a really uh, crucial part in the back half. But um, yeah, so we got this amazing cast and um, just super, super lucky to get everybody that we got. It was just a very laborious process. Was it people you knew? Or did you actually have any kind um, of an audition some, process? We did have, we know, we definitely had uh, Wendy O'Brien cast it. And, oh, yeah, and um, we had... God knows a million million auditions. Um, we uh, saw a lot of people, um, but uh, it's funny. Like a lot of the people, like Bo Murchoff, I had never worked with him before, and same with Tyler Posey, I had never worked with them, but I met them. They'd come mm-hmm. in for me on other things that they weren't right for. And I remember, I like to think of people when I'm writing. It helps me to sort of visualize the characters. And I remember. When writing forward, thinking like he's kind of like a Bo Murchoffy kind of guy, you know, like that kind of <laughs> corn fed, all American, like boy next door sort of thing. And I was thinking about when I wrote Gabriel, thinking about it's like like Tyler Posey with all those tattoos and he's super hot, kind of mysterious. <laughs> so I would think about them, but I had no idea if I would actually get them or not. So did you send I, out breakdowns that said like Bo Murchoff type? It didn't Bo say Bo in. Murchoff. It's funny because <laughs> Bo like Bo's story is completely the opposite because it, it what he did have the advantage that I was picturing him while I was writing writing it but he's all I thought my audition was he's like he's like he I heard him talking in some interview about he's all I thought that I wasn't gonna get the part I thought I didn't have a chance and all of a sudden I heard I was the front runner because he's like it didn't seem like you got there was any reaction or yeah. anything but uh, so but, you did make him audition for the bone oh, no, no he definitely auditioned <laughs> it was because uh, I'd never worked with him before yeah. so I mean Av and I had worked with so Av, you know he was in a short film I did so he um did an audition but um Everybody else did, and Car- the Carly role, um, the Kelly Berglund part, is was very. We saw a million, million people, and it was difficult because that was the hardest role to cast because it was based on a real person. Mm-hmm. So it was, you know, and I didn't want, um, I didn't want Carly, the writer, to play herself. It was just a little too close to home. So I wanted a fictionalized version of Carly to play Carly, <laughs> and so Kelly had that. Uh, we just saw a million people for that part but Kelly just came in like ninth inning Mm -hmm. like we were just about to give up hope and she came in and just knocked out of the park and it was really it's funny Greg Jacobs said this thing he's all you know, he's a lot of times in this casting thing, it's like what's meant to be is exactly, you know, it's just meant to be. And it was like, if we couldn't find her, we couldn't find Carly, we couldn't find her. I was just like, oh my God, we're not going to find her. And we're, we start shooting in two weeks or whatever. And then, you know, Kelly came in and it was just like, thank God we <laughs> waited for you. We've been waiting for you. Where have you been? But yeah, no, the, the, the casting was very uh, intensive for all the parts, certainly. And we had to cast, you know, all 10 episodes at the same time. Right. Um, And because we do have so many actors here, I'm curious, is there um, anything you would want them to know if they're lucky enough to audition for you? Well, for me, it's... uh, (laughs) I I guess we should give these... I mean, every director's different. For me, it helps so much when you're off book. Mm. Like, it really makes a big difference to me because I'm really looking at your face and yeah i mean i'm just it helps me a lot to be out when you're off book and um you know when you take a just a uh it's just i get it's just like people get you get so worn down seeing so many the same the same role over and over and over again and it's the you know and that's why kelly's thing was weird because we were so tired of the audition scene by the time she came in because we'd read like i don't know yeah. like hundreds it seems like hundreds of actors for the part and she just really found something in it that was different and uh you know just had that take that was like oh this is this is different you know and um and that 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 to me i, I think that's kind of intangible um, I mean, I don't want to jump ahead too much, but would you be up for doing another season of this? Uh, yeah, we're actually, Stars has actually asked, asked us to write it. So we've actually written almost the whole season. We're, I'm on episode seven, eight right now. Wow. And I have to say, the first season, for people who can see all 10, the first season is the craziest thing you've ever seen in your life. The second season is even crazier. Like I told Greg Jacobs, I said, yeah, I'm so proud of this show, and I so I love it so much. I lo- it's everything I've ever dreamed it could be. But you know, for the next season, I feel like we've thrown the gauntlet down, and I don't want to repeat season one. And it's like I want to go to a whole another level, and it's definitely. 
<laughs> season. I hope we get to shoot it because it's really um, just uh, definitely, I don't know if TV's ready for it, but, but we are. <laughs> Uh, I'm curious because a lot of your early films, like if I'm not wrong, your first film, Three Bewildered Strangers. Three Bewildered People in the people. Night. It's black yeah. and white. Yes. Um, Very obscure. Cost $5,000? Yes. But you shot it on film. This was before digital, obviously. 16 millimeter black and white. Yes. Wow. Back, in, back in the old school days. And how much has your style changed since like those early movies where, from what I understand, you didn't really worry about permits? Uh-huh. <laughs> well, it's really, it's, it was really interesting. Like we premiered Now Apocalypse at Sundance this year, you yeah, know? Yeah, that's right. And uh, my first film at Sundance was The Living End back in 1992, so that was 27 years ago. And um, I made this comment when I was at Sundance. It's like when we made, premiered The Living End there in 92, it was just like this, I mean, we got distributed, and we were lucky, you know, and we made a, you know, and people saw that movie in the theaters back in those days and watched it on VHS or DVD or whatever people did back in the 90s. But, um, so we were very fortunate, but it was just like this 16 millimeter punk rock underground movie. We made it for like $20,000, me and my friends. Nobody got paid. And it was also, it was like this queer, like couple on the run movie, this outlaw couple. And, you know, they like had sex and like killed people. And it was just like very out there. And I remember when it screened, people were just like, holy shit, this fucking movie. It was very (laughs) way, way, way out of the mainstream. And then to go back there this year, with the apocalypse and it's like you know it's it's still pretty out there <laughs> but it's like a s- series on stars you know what i mean yeah. it's like well, there's billboards on sunset boulevard right yeah. next to like stars born you know what i mean it's, it was it was kind of mind-boggling to me because i don't think the spirit of now apocalypse is really that different mm-hmm. than the living end it's still very kind of outside of the system it's very kind of punk rock and but I feel like the culture has shifted so much. I mean, back in the early 90s, it was shocking to see, like, two guys kiss each other, you know? This is before Will and Grace, before Brokeback Mountain, like, before all of that stuff. And and now, you know, to be the, at Sundance 27 years later with this show where we have, like, you know, Tyler Posey and Avin, Avin Jogia jerking each other off in an alley. You know what I mean? It was just, like... and. It was like fine, it's cool. You know what I mean? Like people are into it. And it's like it was really amazing to me. You know, I've been fortunate enough just the years that I've lived and you know, I'm in my fifties now and just to live through the the age that I lived through and so much has changed. Mm-hmm. The world is so much different now. And in many ways so much better, but also at the same time, you know, we live now in these sort of weird regressive scary times where people are sort of we made so much progress you know and then the people that are just sort of trying to drag us back into the dark ages back to sort of when people were really oppressed and you know like there was like bigotry and like you know white supremacists and all kinds of horrible shit going on um it's just it's just to me i feel like the timing of this show is so crucial right in the sense that it's just it, we just can't go back, right? Mm-hmm. You know, we just have to keep moving forward. And I think that that's really, um, you know, to me, it, it, that's why I'm so excited about the show just just beaming out all over the world. And people, it's in people's houses, whether they want it or not, it's there. <laughs> I want to take a couple of questions from the audience. Um, forgive me in advance if I butcher anyone's name. Uh, Kurt Kanazawa, did I, did I get that? Oh, hey. Um, Wants to know, do you see yourself as a Japanese-American filmmaker storyteller? And are there Japanese-American or any kind of stories you look forward to telling? Um, Yeah, I mean, I definitely, being Asian-American is a very big part of my uh, sensibility, I think. Um, As well, you know, obviously as being uh, queer or whatever I am. (laughs) Fluid or wherever wherever I fit on the spectrum. I mean, it's definitely a part of... um, what makes me me, I feel super fortunate in the sense that um, I feel like what, because my films have always been sort of be about being an outsider, being different, I, I really appreciate that aspect of my personality because I feel like it makes me different. It makes my vision sort of individual and outside of 
the sort of normal straight white male uh, patriarchal whatever and I think that that's um, super cool and I'm super super grateful and thankful for that I was thinking you've covered so many genres um, I mean like I, I think of Smiley Face is almost a screwball comedy. And if you haven't seen it, no, every the, actor should like see the, it. It's just like the Stoner movie. Yes. <laughs> the <laughs> doll Stoner movie. Um, and then you do something like Mysterious Skin. Um, I am curious, is there a genre you want to tackle that you haven't done yet? Um, I, I, um, I like all different kinds of movies. Mm. I mean, I went to film school, so that was one of the coolest things for me about the show because the show is so, the universe of it is so kind of all expanding. Um, it was able to incorporate, and I want to do even more of this in season two. We were talking about, like, we should have a musical episode. Yes. <laughs> but the idea of this show that has this universe where kind of anything can happen almost, mm -hmm. um, you know, because there's, ac there's aspects of science fiction and sort of thrillers. So we're going to have these kind of Kill Bill kind of fight scenes next season. Nice. Like, there, there's just a lot that, you know, obviously it's a first and foremost to me, you know, besides a sort of sci-fi David Lynch kind of Twin Peaksy elements, it's it, to me very much a, like HBO R-rated sex comedy, like a millennial sex comedy a la you know, girls are insecure or any of those shows. And so, but outside of that, there's so many other um, colors to play mm -hmm. with and so many other genres that we can incorporate. That's one of the things that I love about the universe that we've set up. It kind of can go all these different places. Later on in season one, the Severing character gets involved in this relationship that literally we called like the rear window man, <laughs> where she's like sees a guy across the hall who is Jonathan Sheck from Doom Generation. <laughs> and um, they have this weird voyeuristic relationship. So um, it was just super fun to be. And, you know, even the score that we use at that point is very kind of Hitchcockian and very much an homage to that whole genre. So it was, that's one of the things I loved about doing the show is that it was like kind of, we can almost do anything. Yeah. Uh, speaking of David Lynch, um, we have a question from Ricarte Rivera. Rivera? Oh, right down there. Hey. Um, you called Cheryl Lee's performance in Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me one of the greatest performances in the history of cinema. Um, yes, and anybody who hasn't seen it has to rush out and watch it right now. That movie's amazing. Uh, I haven't seen it. I'm embarrassed what? to admit. I know I'm the worst. I think it's his most underrated movie. That, that's mine. Do you need to know the series? Or can you go in... No. no, it's kind of brilliant on its own. All right, I'll, I, I promise by next week I will do it. You can call, you can <laughs> call me on it. Um, in the projects you write and direct, how do you bring out your actor's greatest work? And what should a serious actor do every day? To, oh, that, that's a separate question. I'll get to that. Um, so, how do you bring out? I mean, for me, my you know, people always you know, people talk about like Joe Gordon Levitt's performance and like Mr. Skin, how amazing it was. How did you get that performance out of Joe Gordon Levitt? For me, it's like that old cliche about you know, ninety percent of directing is casting. It's just like you know, I did Joe did that performance. I didn't like you're a bird and you're. You know, I mean, it's like I cast the act. I really am super super careful and picky about casting. I'm really looking for something super specific, and so. It's really, for me as a director, it's about creating a comfortable environment on the set. Particularly, you know, my movies and, you know, the show obviously has a lot, they have a lot of sex scenes and a lot of scenes where actors feel super vulnerable. And it's my job to make sure that the environment is super safe for them to work in and that they feel always comfortable. Whenever we do sex scenes, I always tell my actors, it's like, if you ever need to talk to me privately, like if somebody's looking at you weird or you feel weird or something weird's going on the set, just... No matter how busy I am, just pull me aside and we can have a little private co consultation. So they always feel like I have their back. And so for me, is that, you know, for actors, it definitely is creating that safe space for them and just letting them work. But, you know, like Julianne Moore, like she gives the funniest quote one that I love, you know, in some interview where she's all, you know, I don't want a director to tell me how to act. You know what I mean? Like I'm an actor, like that's my job. And so that's to me, I mean, I really you know rely on my actors to just you know as a director sometimes it's just adjusting it a little bit like a little more a little less a little this a little yeah but it's it, they're the ones that are creating those performances and i'm so grateful for all the amazing actors i've worked with uh not asking for examples but have you ever felt you made a mistake in casting and what do you do then not no i don't know not really i mean i've had kind of 
difficult, tricky situations. Sure. But, but I'm really, I'm looking for something really specific in casting. Like it's very, it's like um, it's like a, I'm I'm looking for something that is that kind of magical thing. You know, like a like a lot of actors. It's like um, I'm looking for my thing about particularly like for someone like Smiley Face, especially. It was like. You know, Anna's on screen for literally that whole entire movie, like every frame of that movie. And I'm like, I want somebody you can't take your eyes off of. You know what I mean? Like literally, like that's why I cast Anna. It's like when she, like whenever she was, she'd always played like the girlfriend or the second banana and like, you know, lost in translation or something. And it was like, she's the one I'm looking at. She's mm-hmm. the one that's stealing the movie. You know what I mean? And that, that's the one, that's the person I want. And that's kind of, in general, high cast is just like looking for those people that just, you just can't stop watching them. Yeah. And that's my big thing. So, uh, The second part of the question was what should a serious actor do every day to jumpstart their acting career? Every day. Um, I can't really talk that much. <laughs> I'm not an actor. I don't know anything about acting. I can talk as a filmmaker. I think it's, for me, as a filmmaker, it was really important. You know, I went to film school and um, uh, undergraduate and graduate. And as a director, I just saw everything. You know what I mean? It, I think as an actor, I think you can sort of do the same thing. It was just like, don't be on Instagram. Don't do this. Don't. <laughs> just like really watch as much stu- great stuff as you can, you know, and, and try not to try not to just watch the the potato chips in the can. <laughs> you know I mean, like, like just try to like. I mean, for me as a filmmaker, I know my films are deeper, and there's more going on in them because I watched everything. Yeah, you know, I didn't mm-hmm. just watch it. I mean, that's when I have f- friends that teach film school. And you saw a lot of these young filmmakers. They literally just watch like whatever is like Wes Anderson or whatever is playing in the theater right now. Like I want to be like that or whatever filmmaker was at Sundance last year. I want to make that movie. And it's like, you know, back in the day, back when old people like me went to film school, we watched like we watched like Charlie Chaplin movies, Buster Keaton movies, Hitchcock movies, Eisenstein movies, Kurosawa movies, like just everything. You know, I mean, some of it's harder to get through than it's not just oh, it's all fun to watch, but it's <laughs> important. You know, what I mean, yeah. it's like to have for me as a filmmaker, I'm so grateful for that experience because it's like it's nutritious, you know, and you really learn so and I think for actors the same thing you can learn so much it is different you know the acting style in say a 30 screwball comedy is totally different than you know realistic acting in 2019 but you can there's a shitload every actor in this room can learn from like Cary Grant yeah Yeah, I mean just watch fucking some Cary Grant movies or in in our Carol Lombard movies and see like how much you can learn I'm so glad you admitted they're not always easy to get through because um, have you seen Celine and Julie go boating? Uh, I have not. Okay, but this I is a, know of like it, a three-hour sure. French film from uh, like the '70s, maybe even right. '60s, and I resented the hell out of them making us watch it in film school. But it, it, I think about it all the time. Yeah, no, those like you know, I'm a big Godard fan, and um, I watch so many Godard movies in school, and some of them are real difficult. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it's like they really the it. Even if you don't realize it at the time, they could have a, like you said, a giant impact, and and it it just makes you more rounded, you know, as opposed to just like, oh, I want to copy whatever is popular right now. Yeah, and just even knowing uh, Fastbinder's work, did I pronounce that right? Fastbinder, uh, Fastbinder. <laughs> but no, there's so there's so like especially now we're we're so far down from yeah. the beginning of where cinema started, but there's so much fucking amazing stuff out there that most people don't even know about. You know? I'm talking about. <laughs> R.W. Foss. Foss. Foss, Foss Binder, not Michael Fassbender. In case oh, you're wondering. Yeah. Foss. <laughs> Although his stuff is great, too. You should check <laughs> it out. Um, but you start realizing how almost nothing is original anymore, and there's so many artists who owe a debt oh, yeah. to him. Uh, no, yeah. I definitely... Uh, I mean, it's just all debt. Because you know? <laughs> everything's been done, frankly. So it's like you can only steal from the best, you know, steal from the the best of the past. And it helps if you're stealing from things that aren't like last year. Yeah. Uh, Everything's just my been opinion. done, but I'm not sure if I've seen a show <laughs> like this before. So. This, everything's been. I mean, this show definitely shows all my influences, but it's all filtered through what yeah. I was talking about, my own thing, which kind of makes it its own thing. Uh, and finally, we have a question from Kayla Pennenberg. Everyone's in the 
front row. Oh, um, all the way in the front row. <laughs> wants to know, what was your favorite thing about directing this show, and how does it compare to other productions you've directed? My favorite thing, it's weird. Um, it's uh, It's got to be these actors. I mean, I've worked with some amazing actors in my time, but seeing all 10 episodes um, strung together, it really kind of blew me away like how invested you get in these characters. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to do TV because TV is a week to week thing and you really have, I, I always talk about um, Sex and the City and how me and my friends talk about Sex and the City as if those characters are friends of ours, you know, like, oh, when Miranda did that thing, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like a, that actually happened to you, you know? And that's what's so fun to me and exciting about TV is that you have that ongoing relationship you now week after week or, you know, in this case, like one binge at a time. And, and um, you know, and it's like seeing the characters um, like grow through these 10 episodes, I was kind of blown away by how invested you get in them. Um, Carly, when she was like, there's episodes in the back half of the show that literally like always make me cry. Yeah. And even though the show is like a f comedy and there's like a, lots of crazy sex and stuff in it and aliens and all this other stuff, the characters, like, you, you become very invested in them. And then that's a testament, I think, to these this cast that we got. I mean, we were so lucky to get them and they were all so amazing and so, you know, and it was not an easy show to shoot. <laughs> you know, we shot uh, very quickly, a lot of pages and, um, but the actors had a giant advantage in the sense that all of the actors, all 10 scripts were done when we were casting so they could literally read their whole season. Mm -hmm. So they knew, all of them knew their whole arc, like Ford and Severine, they knew all the ups and downs of that relationship. So they could go into the scenes very prepared and like knowing what was going to happen next. So, um, but that helped a lot. But I have to say, it was working with these actors and all of them are so, such troopers, so great to work with. I just love all of them, so. Well, I want to remind everyone, um, there's nine more episodes to go after this one. You can get stars, you can download the Stars, Stars app. app. Stars app. <laughs> for free. Seven days. So wait, they're all available on the Stars app right now? Yeah, they, Stars is this weird thing with us and I think they're sort of, Stars is, they just have this new app and they're figuring it all out. Um, I think they realized our show is very bingy and yeah, yeah. Um, they're actually making Vita, which is a show of theirs from last year, also available as binge um, because of our show. They originally were like, oh, it's going to be half an hour for 10 weeks. And I was like, oh, that's like a long time to wait for people, <laughs> millennials who are used to seeing everything at once. And, um, and then they, you know, a couple of weeks ago, they're like, oh, we should, you know, people are really wanting to binge it. Da, 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 da. So um, they did this thing where they, made them available to binge. So we're still screening every... For people who want to watch it old school way, you That's can just... That's what I've been doing You can watch stars. it every Sunday at 9 o'clock or... I think it's 9 o'clock, right? Um... And so you can watch it one episode at a time if that's the way you want to do it. Or for, you know, people who are... Want, want everything now. You, you, you just get the um, you get the stars app. I think you can download them and everything, so you can actually own them. But um, yeah, all, all ten episodes are available for binge. So people. I didn't are, realize that. Well, I got to get home now. You got to get home uh, and binge it. <laughs> I want to thank you guys for being such a great audience. Thank you so much for being here. Congratulations on your dream show. Thank you so much. Thanks.